Hello, my name is Alex LaPierre, and this is my presentation on Arizona's Adobe architecture, the Sonoran Row House. This image is from a Jesuit priest that was stationed in Baja California in the mid 1700s before the Jesuit expulsion. And it's an image that shows you some of the Sonoran Row House architecture, both plastered and unplastered Adobe buildings. A little bit of introduction uh, before I get started with the presentation. My name is Alex LaPierre. I'm the program director for Nonprofit Border Community Alliance. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Tubac, Arizona. BCA's mission is dedicated to bridging the border and fostering community through education, collaboration, and cultural exchange. This presentation forms part of one of our initiatives called the Borderlands Forum. A little bit of background on myself. Prior to my job with the nonprofit, I worked with for the National Park Service in both fields of interpretation and historic preservation. My last post was with the Juan Bautista Lanza National Historic Trail. I also worked for Tumacacri, where I formed part of the preservation crew, Pecos National Historical Park in New Mexico, and also Fort Union National Monument near Las Vegas, New Mexico, where I also was part of the preservation team. So a little bit of the why behind this presentation. The Sonoran Adobe Row House is the only regional as opposed to national architectural style present in Tucson. This is a quote from Aliza Husband, who is forming part of the Tucson Pima County Historical Commission in her publication, Tucson Suburban Adobe Row Houses. The Sonoran Row House style is really our own style here in Arizona, and it's deserving of recognition. This image that you see here is of one of my favorite examples of this architectural tradition. This is the Casa Cordova, which is in downtown Tucson. It actually forms part of the, the complex of the Tucson Museum of Art. So to kind of go over the outline of this presentation, first we'll be talking about the environment of this architectural tradition, including the geographical setting, the Sonoran Desert, and some of the arid land resources available for the construction of this architecture. Second, we'll kind of go into history, looking at the social cultural timeline, the contributions of the different cultures uh, to this architectural style, including the indigenous peoples, the Spanish and Mexican period, and finally the American territorial era. Third, we'll look at the characteristics that define the Sonoran Row House style, including the morphology. We'll look at a case study, We'll see other examples. And finally, the fourth topic we'll cover is the future. We'll look at the ghosts of urban renewal that took place in the mid 20th century. We'll also discuss the National Historic Landmark designation process. And finally, we'll look at finding the answers for the future from the past, what the Sonoran Row House tradition can teach us about building in the Southwest in the future. So starting off with the environment, uh, here you see a map of the Pimari Alta, which is now a binational re region shared by both the United States and Mexico, um, comprising of the states of Arizona, north of the border, and the state of Sonora, south of the border. Uh, here you have actually two arrows where I've indicated where uh, the two communities where you can see Sonoran Row House architecture north of the border. Uh, that includes Tucson and also Tubac. There are linked on this map by the Santa Cruz River. In that time, it was known as the Santa Maria River. So when we're looking at the geographic setting, the Sonoran Row House style is really inspired by the geography and the climate, which are the determinants of the availability of construction resources and shelter adaptations of this region. They're also infused with local and foreign cultural conceptions. Of critical importance were the ephemeral waterways of both Arizona and Sonora. Settlement and arid lands are inextricably linked to the availability of water for human settlement. Our orientation or perspective when approaching this topic is also fundamental. Traditionally, as Americans, we have approached our cultural self-understanding from an east to west axis, um, as expressed by the idea of manifest destiny. In the Southwest, this is not the case. 
where you have pre-Columbian cultural transmission and indigenous transitions that traveled both from the South Mesoamerica into the South American Southwest and also from the North to the South with the arrival of the Apaches and the Navajos. This South-North axis of cultural transmission was prevalent during the centuries of Spanish and Mexican periods as well. Here in this map, you can see the, the different rivers of the state of Sonora and also the rivers in Southern Arizona, including the San Pedro and the Santa Cruz. These rivers were the focus of Spanish and Mexican settlement, uh, primarily because of the mines that were located in, in, the, in the mountain ranges that separated these river valleys uh, and also the access for water to enable settlement. Finally, we'll look here at the, at the Sonoran Desert. Some of the, the things to share about the Sonoran Desert is that it's the world's wettest and most biodiverse desert. Uh, it's now a current binational region it expands over, uh, including five different states. You have Baja California Sur, Baja California Norte, California, Arizona, and the state of Sonora. There are also a diverse adjacent ecological zones in what's considered the, the Sonoran Desert area. You have Lower Sonoran Desert, the area around Tucson. You have Upper Sonoran Desert, like the area around Chubac and Nogales. You also have grasslands that you see uh, around the Sonoida Patagonia area, uh, oak woodlands and pine forests in the higher elevations, and also thorn scrub in those river valleys we mentioned in Sonora, as well as tropical deciduous forests, which you'll see in the southern part of the state, um, primarily around the nucleus of uh, Alamos. And it's also important to mention the Sonoran Desert's fifth season, the monsoon season, which traditionally starts on the day of St. John the Baptist, San Juan Bautista at the end of June. So with this rain also, you have an impact on the development of the, the shape and structure of the architecture. So let's look a little bit at the, the, what this Sonoran Desert provides for the building of architecture. Um, the arid land resources. Uh, here you have the ingredients for the expression of a vernacular architecture. Vernacular meaning architecture associated with domestic and functional rather than public or, or monumental buildings. Here you can see some of the stones that would have been important for the building of foundations for earthen architecture buildings. You, with adobe buildings, typically what happens is that there's wicking, water wicking up from the ground into the adobe walls. And one way of preventing that wicking of water into the adobe walls is by placing a stone foundation at the bottom of your earthen walls. Uh, here you also have uh, the adobe bricks, uh, which given in, being in a land of, of less rain, uh, it's a very appropriate building material. Uh, it, it's, it generates a thermal mass. It helps shelter individuals in the extreme climates of the deserts. Uh, you also have a mesquite tree. Here's an image of a mesquite tree in front of Tumacacri National Historical Park. Mesquites would have been used for uh, vigas, the beams, uh, doors, framing. Uh, you have ocotillos as well, uh, those beautiful plants uh, for uh, roofing uh, laths um, in between the vigas and also for the constructions of ramadas and um, kind of ancillary corrals. Uh, here you also have an image of uh, dead saguaro. Um, those saguaro ribs would have also been used for lasts uh, on, on the ce ceiling as well. And they can be still seen in some of the old uh, adobes in the Barrio Viejo. If you look above um, you, and look at the ceiling, you can see sometimes they're made of ocotillo, sometimes they're made of saguaro ribs. Uh, it's also interesting to note um, Madera Canyon. Madera in Spanish means wood. Uh, so the Spaniards and Mexicans would have gone up into the higher elevations in order to harvest uh, pines, uh, other woods, in order for construction means. Now we'll talk about the social cultural timeline. Here you have an image, a beautiful image by Paul Marosha. Um, it's a historical reconstruction of what 
Tucson would have looked in the year 1810. You have in the foreground at the base of a mountain, you have uh, the, the complex, the mission complex, and on the other side of the river, you have the San Agustin Presidio. So we'll begin first by talking about the indigenous people of this area. Uh, this slide is focusing around the Tohono O'odham people, which were historically known as the Pimas. Uh, here you have them harvesting the, the fruit from the saguaro trees. Uh, you also have an image of uh, a traditional dwelling. Uh, you can see there of thatch. Uh, and also the, the engineering they did to, to harvest water in the desert, uh, the hydraulic engineering. Uh, the architecture that the Tohono O'odham had was really one that was respecting and reflecting the surrounding environment as well as the mobility of the people. And the Tohono O'odham were semi-nomadic people. Um, they were also different groups known as the Sovaipuris that lived along the rivers as well. Um, and you also have other groups that arrived around the same time that the Spanish uh, arrived from the south coming to the north. From the north coming to the south were the Apaches and the Navajos as no nomadic people. And here you have two examples of some of their traditional dwellings, uh, including a, what's known as a wikiup. Uh, here you can see the ribs of an Apache wikiup, um, which tells you pretty much about their uh, mobility, that mobility was central to their lifestyle. So the ability to um, construct a shelter uh, with relatively rapid, rapidly and also with ease uh, was very important. Uh, the other image is in, of the Navajo lands. Uh, this is what's known as a, a hogan, where you see both the combination of timber and earthen architecture. Um, this earthen architecture really uh, emphasizes the importance of thermal mass, um, the ability to store heat, uh, and basically um, have an inertia for high temperature fluctuations from freezings to extreme hot temperatures. Uh, one of my favorite examples that we can see today of indigenous architecture is actually located at Chimacacri National Historical Park. Um, here you have uh, what's called uh, Mehak Ki. It's pronounced Muraki. And it was built in 1997 uh, with representatives of, from the O'odham nation. Uh, it's a traditional O'odham dwelling. And you have also the adjoining Ramada made out of Ocatillos, which we've mentioned, and also the mesquite timbers. Uh, this structures were also known in the Spanish and Mexican times as Hakal. Uh, it's basically a wattle and daub construction where you have a lace of, of Ocatillo ribs and uh, mesquite timber frames um, making the building. Uh, if you ever have a chance to visit Tumacacri, I, uh, I really recommend uh, visiting uh, this structure, the Muraki, uh, and uh, noticing the temperature difference uh, from the outside uh, to when you go into the inside. So now we'll talk about the Spanish and Mexican period uh, in our area, which really started in 1540 with the arrival of the conquistador Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, and it ended in 1853-1854 with the arrival of the Americans and the, and the Gadsden Purchase of Southern Arizona. Here you have an image also from the Jesuit Ignacio Terch uh, of what the Spanish called the Soldados de Cuera, or the Leather Jacket Soldiers, uh, and here's an image of him uh, mounted with his uh, daughter so when we talk about the Spanish influence uh, on the architecture here in the American Southwest and Northern Mexico, we have to look back a little bit into the, the history of the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, it is very important to rem remember that that peninsula, modern Portugal and Spain, was colonized at least six different times by varying empires. The Phoenician, the Greek, the Carthaginians, the Roman, the Germanic tribes like the Visigoths, and finally the Moors. They all left significant cultural marks upon modern Spain. But here we'll kind of focus on the Romans and also the, Mar the Moors, as they left the strongest mark on the architectural traditions of Spain. Uh, here you see um, some of the most significant monuments of Roman Spain uh, that are still existing today. On the upper left, you have the famous aqueduct in Segovia. 
and below that you have the Roman theater in Merida, and finally you have an image that shows a typical Roman villa in Spain, um, this kind of interesting orientation uh, where the focus is the interior. Um, the biggest room of the house is actually the inner gardens uh, and atriums. Um, and you see this style uh, pretty emblematic in the southern Spanish town of Cordoba. The Romanization of, Hispa of Hispania was a process by which the Roman culture was introduced into Iberia um, and really absorbed by the local population. You had Roman customs, religion, laws, um, uh, gaining the favor of the indigenous population. Uh, and the ancient Romans also placed outposts known as presidium on the, on the outer edges of their empire. This is a term and concept that the Spanish would later reutilize here in the American Southwest and Northern Mexico to describe their frontier garrison installations, which they called presidios instead of presidium. The Im other important culture to really recognize when looking at Spanish influence in the Southwest and Northern Mexico uh, in architecture is the legacy of the Moors. Uh, from 711 until 1492, uh, about you know seven, eight centuries, um, there was Islamic Spain. Uh, they, their cultural inf influence cast a long shadow felt into this present day. Uh, during the reconquest of Spain by the Christians, Muslims were absorbed into the Northern kingdoms that began to expand southward. Uh, the aesthetic preferences of the Moors were considered really high style and culture by the Christians. So they actually employed conquered Muslims, often as slaves, um, in the construction of their, their middle and southern Iberian Peninsula territorial conquests, and even brought them into the north. And it is estimated that 10% of the Spanish language or, originated uh, from Arabic. And interestingly, many of the words that pertain to construction in the Spanish vocabulary, they have an Arabic etymology, words like adobe, uh, alarife, um, master masons, and albanil, like the bricklayers. Uh, so it's interesting to, to really think about how the different ways that the Moors influenced the building style. Uh, they tended to build more with brick, whereas in the north of the, uh, the northern Spanish Christian kingdoms built with stone, uh, they also, they also kind of served the, the same function that the Native Americans did in, during the mission times. Uh, they were the builders of the, of the Christian churches, even though they belonged to a different faith. Um, they were known as the mudejars. Um, the mudejars basically in Arabic means those permitted to stay, those allowed to stay um, in the Christian kingdoms. Uh, and you can see their influence uh, today. And even across oceans, here's one example of Mudejar architecture projections. Uh, on the far right, you have the mosque in Marrakesh, Morocco. Um, on the far left, you have an image, a drawing by John Russell Bartlett, uh, an American uh, who also sketched Tucson as well. His image of the church in Arispe, Sonora. Uh, and then you, in the middle, you have an image of that church from 2014. Uh, the pyramid that you see on top of the, the bell tower was actually added in the early 20th century. And you can see the original look of it in the drawing, uh, the mid 19th century drawing by John Russell Bartlett uh, here. Um, what's interesting about this bell tower is that it's a standalone, as you can see in the middle picture. Um, and it resembles this minaret from the mosques uh, in, in Morocco. And what's important to remember is as the Christians were basically taking over the south of Spain, a lot of the mosques were basically converted into churches. So a lot of the architectural elements of the mosques and minarets uh, were absorbed into the Spanish style of constructing churches. And here you can see this on the far edge of the empire in Arispe Sonora, in the Rio Sonora, a very strong semblance to this Mudejar architecture we have described. Now we're gonna talk about the black robes arriving. Uh, Father Kino arrived in what's now the Pimaria Alta, Northern Sonora, Southern Arizona in 1687. Uh, and the Jesuits or the black robes 
they lasted here in this region until 1767 when they were expelled by the Spanish king uh, from all Spanish dominions. Uh, here you have a uh, great image from uh, the artist Ted de Grazia of Padre Quino crossing the Colorado River. Uh, they were the ones that began to build uh, missions uh, here in the Southwest, uh, bringing this kind of Iberian concepts of uh, architecture into this region. So the first kind of Spanish colonial frontier institution we're gonna look at is the mission um, as kind of a prototype for uh, the, the eventual Sonoran row house architectural style. Uh, here you have an image of the Carmel mission in California uh, by a French explorer, uh, La Perouse. Uh, the mission uh, in what is now the city limits of Tucson was actually known as a visita. It was a visiting station of the San Javier del Bac mission, which is just on the southern outskirts of Tucson. Uh, the visita means that it was uh, a church that did not have a resident priest. Uh, this was the furthest frontier. There was a lack of priests. So usually there would be a cabecera mission, uh, cabecera meaning head mission where there was a resident priest. Uh, that resident priest would also have three or four different visita or visiting station missions attached uh, to the head mission where uh, almost like a circuit rider, uh, the, the priest would perform uh, marriages, baptisms, um, rites of death, um, etc. And so the original mission that was built at the base of A Mountain uh, was known by Kino as San Cosme y Damian uh, de Tucson. Um, and here you could see Kino arriving. Um, what in this image is actually uh, from the later Franciscan era. So after the Jesuits were replaced, the Franciscans came in, uh, in 17, starting in 1768. This image is of the convento, which would have been attached to the main mission building. Uh, as you can see, it's a two-story structure. Uh, and you can see the, the, the real mass of the adobe buildings. This image is from around the 1880s. Uh, you can see the arches as well. Uh, the remains of it were demolished in the 1950s for a garbage dump. Uh, here's some additional images, including from the Santa Cruz River and also an aerial image from the, the vantage point of A Mountain. Uh, it's important to think of the mission not just as a church, but uh, as a kind of a self-sufficient uh, uh, complex uh, of uh, attached gardens, uh, pastoral lands. Uh, the priests were basically trying to promote the euro agrian Euro-pastoral uh, lifestyle uh, amongst the Native Americans in this area. Tucson is really an ideal example to study the urban expression uh, of, in arid lands, the American Southwest in northern Mexico. It's because on one side of the river you have the, the frontier institution of the mission, and on the other side of the river you have the other frontier institution, which would have been the military or the Spanish civil government of the of the Presidio. And here we have an image of of a Presidio and also some of the soldiers, the soldados de Cuera that were mentioned uh, previously. The Presidio in Tucson was actually um, moved there from its original installation in Tubac. Uh, Tubac the presidios weren't really a walled, uh, 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 enclosed settlement. Uh, there was a guard house, as you can see there in the left. And then there was many different adobe buildings surrounding it where the soldiers would have lived. Uh, and also a, a church uh, where today St. Anne's Church is in Tubac. You have uh, back then what was called Santa Gertrudes. Uh, and today you still have that plaza where you can see this image. The Tubac Presidio was founded in 1752, following the, the Pima Rebellion. Uh, it, the, the Presidio was moved up into Tucson in 1776 uh, on the orders of Hugo O'Connor, uh, Spanish military men originally from Ireland. And the logic behind moving it north was to protect the land route uh, to California, where the new colony was founded in 1769. Uh, so in this great image, you can kind of see the architectural evolution from Presidio um, 
the really the kind of the formative era of the of the old pueblo of Tucson, 1853, right at the cusp of the the Gadsden Purchase. Uh, so originally with the Mesquite Stockade taking advantage of the the Mesquite Forest, which would have grown along the the edges of the the Santa Cruz River, um, where now the I-10 freeway is, um, and then later it would have been an earthen construction um, uh, of walls to uh, keep the enclosure. Uh, so some things to keep in mind when we're thinking about this architecture of a frontier uh, is the real deep history uh, uh, as a borderlands uh, and safety shaping the building form. Uh, as I mentioned, the same time that the Spanish were arriving from the south to the north, uh, no, new or newly arrived nomadic uh, Native Americans from, from what is now Canada, Athabascan speakers like the Apaches and the Navajos were arriving from that era and coming south. Uh, and so you really had a defense orientated functionality. Um, in Spanish, um, the kind of the row style of the, of the presidios and the missions were really, were known as casa moro, literally house wall. So taking advantage of a contiguous, um, not separated, uh, separate dwellings um, in order to form a wall for protection. Uh, Apache attacks um, started in the 16th century and lasted up until the 1880s, so actually during the, the American territorial uh, era. It's also important to note the initial scarcity of architects, uh, particularly in the er early era with the Jesuits. Um, the buildings were very simple hall-like structures with flat roofs. Um, it was very hard to uh, entice uh, master masons, architects to this uh, further frontier because of the, the dangerous situation. Um, in fact, it has been said that the architect that eventually built San Javier Mission, uh, San Javier del Bach Mission was paid something like two times or even up to three times what he would have normally made uh, in central Mexico as a way of attracting him to the, the furthest flungs of the Spanish empire. Um, and also to kind of really uh, emphasize the, the spirituality of, of the Roman Catholic uh, faith uh, for the Spanish that was transmitted to the indigenous. Uh, here you can see manifestations of that um, that are lasting into this very day. Uh, you see this uh, with the, the shrines, the existence of shrines. Uh, if you visit Tumacacri, there's several shrines along the frontage road. Uh, you see shrines also along uh, highways where people have unfortunately passed away in car accidents. Um, but uh, the El Tierradito, the castaway sh shrine that you have in the Barrio uh, Viejo is a really important monument and really underscores the importance of the Roman Catholic faith uh, to the Spanish, Mexicans, and even indigenous people. And you have an image here of, by Ted de Gracia and also an image of the original El Tierradito uh, which was just around the corner of where the present one is found today, uh, as you can see here in this image, uh, directly behind El Minuto restaurant. Um, to kind of give you a little bit of a window into what was life was like in a in an early uh, in early Tucson, I have these two great quotes um, from George O'Han's diary. Uh, from August 29th, Saint Augustine was brought on the plaza, decorated in fine style with flowers. The slow pace of the priests and the people, their mournful song together with the cross lighted candles gave the scene a, a solemn appearance. After marching around a while, they came back to the church. And August 30, he writes, the town is full of huckster stands, fruits, pies, cakes, and many other things for sale. Uh, watermelons, pomegranates, which he calls granadas, uh, peaches, none worth eating, he notes, uh, tend for a bit. Uh, the pies are made of jerk beef and red pepper. Uh, I think he is uh, mentioning either carne con chile burritos or uh, machaca burritos uh, there. So they kind of give a little bit of a, of a sense of what life would have been like in the mid uh, 19th century um, in uh, a Tucson that was just coming outside of the, the Presidio and starting to really become a, a, an urban center. Uh, and finally, we will talk about the American territorial era. Um, the Gadsden Purchase was really uh, the last little bit of the lower 48 of the United States that was tacked on. And the 
the logic behind uh, the Gadsden Purchase was basically they wanted a, a transcontinental uh, railroad uh, also going across the southern states. This is the lead up to the Civil War. So the southern states also saw value in uh, having a transcontinental railroad. And of course, also from a logistical standpoint, uh, it, it's a lot less track you have to lay from, let's say, the Texas coast or New Orleans to the coast of California than it would have been uh, from, let's say, New Jersey uh, all the way to the, the coast in Oregon. And so that's why uh, this southern piece of Arizona from the Gila River down to what is now Nogales was purchased uh, in 1854 from Santa Ana. I like to include this quote because you can really see the misunderstanding, the ethnocentrism of American perceptions when they came first into Tucson in this, this really early era. Um, this is actually from uh, J. Ross Brown, an Irish American traveler uh, from his book, Adventures in the Apache Country, a tour through Arizona and Sonora uh, from 1864. He says, Adobe walls, hard earth floors, baked and dried Mexicans, Sorback burros, coyote dogs, dogs, and terracotta children. A city of mud boxes, dingy and dilapidated, cracked and baked into a composite of dust and filth, littered about with broken corrals, sheds, bake ovens, carcasses of dead animals, and broken pottery. Barren of verdure, parched, naked, and grimly desolate in the glare of the southern sun. Uh, so, as you can see, there's not really um, an understanding um, coming from this Eastern or, or Western, Northern, Western European uh, perception and understanding for the logic and the importance of uh, earth and architecture uh, here, and also the racial undertones of his uh, commentary as well. And here you have an image from the 19th century of uh, Tucson. Uh, you can see Many of the buildings are unplastered, although you can see that the faint traces of plaster in one of the buildings in the, uh, the background uh, there as well. Uh, and here you have some of the, um, the earliest maps of, of Tucson. The one on the left is from 1862. It's the Ferguson map, uh, a major in the U.S. Army uh, that was stationed here. And you can see the outline of the original Presidio Wall and how uh, the as time went on, uh, buildings began to extend outside of the limit and protection of the Presidio wall uh, to the south and a little bit to the west of the original Presidio. And then on the right, you can see how the occupied area expanded in the next decade in the 1870s. You can see uh, growth to the, to the east, north, and south. And here's another wonderful image from 1880, uh, where you have some great, uh, great examples of the Sonoran row house style. Uh, you can notice the canalis, you can notice the flat roofs uh, as well, uh, some of the shade structures uh, in front of the buildings uh, as well. This is um, Meyer Street looking north. And now we'll talk about the characteristics. What makes the Sonoran row house uh, style so unique? Uh, as a traditional urban expression of the surrounding Sonoran desert landscape. So we'll begin talking about the morphology, the, the qualities of the architecture. Um, what's really unique about the Sonoran row house style is that the buildings are flush with the property line. Uh, so instead of having you know, a front yard, uh, a backyard, um, and two side yards, narrow side yards with little purpose whatsoever, and the actual building in the middle of that, that property line you have the opposite. You have the buildings be, being built right up to the, the property line, uh, basically the, the sidewalk, as you'll see to, uh, today in the Barrio Viejo. Um, and instead, the focus is actually in the inner courtyard, uh, private inner courtyard, this kind of um, this space that is was really utilized as kind of a, a respite from the summer heat where you'd have um, you know, plants like fig trees growing, like you see in the, the Sosa Carrillo house today, um, uh, kind of an area uh, where you would uh, escape from the, 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 the extremes of temperatures. Um, th that, those inner communal um, courtyards were frequently communal as well. Uh, you also had high ceilings um, with the idea that hot air rises. Um, and so you'll notice the, the kind of the, the real high ceilings, especially in the the um, 
Sonoran row houses that you'll find around the Tucson Museum of Art area, the, the Presidio District. Uh, you'll also notice deeply recessed doors and window openings. Uh, the idea behind those deeply recessed door and window openings is to avoid uh, direct sunlight uh, making uh, its way into the uh, the shelter of the interior of the adobe row houses. Um, it's kind of a technique to basically help with keeping the temperatures uh, down. Uh, you also have shared walls with your neighbors. Um, so the idea of a row house is that you uh, have a contiguous line of buildings um, that share um, that share walls with your neighbors, whether they're a business or another dwelling. Um, and think about that. Uh, so instead of having uh, two, four sides of direct solar radiation on the sun, by sharing at least uh, two sides of your building, you only have two sides of solar radiation. So also helping with keeping the temperature uh, down. Uh, another um, emblematic uh, kind of detail of the Sonoran Row House style is flat roofs with parapets. Um, there was a lack of wood uh, in being air lands that we had, uh, that we are in. Uh, and so for um, uh, roofing, uh, you had to do with less. Uh, and so a lot of the Spaniards, Mexicans would go to Madera Canyon uh, and, and get the vigas uh, and uh, just uh, have a flat roof uh, with, you know, with whatever wood they could find, the, the best beams that they could find. And usually the, the, the length of the beams is what determined really the width of the building. So that's why you see these buildings being um, built in kind of a linear format, uh, basically. Uh, as you had uh, money and manpower, uh, there'd be rooms added on in a linear format. Uh, the parapets are the, the, the kind of the, the ledges, the, the raised edges around the, um, the roof. Uh, that would have been a defensive feature. Um, Oftentimes when uh, the dust cloud of the Apaches were coming, um, the, the mission bells would ring, everybody would kind of batter down. Uh, soldiers would go up to the roofs of these buildings and use them basically as a, um, a defensive feature. Um, you also had the canales, which, are, uh, which wick away the water from the building. Uh, in the early times, they probably would have been made out of mesquite. Uh, later with the arrival of the railroads um, and new materials, uh, you see the cylindrical uh, metal uh, canals that are pretty common uh, in the Barrio Viejo today. Um, the Casa Muro or the row style that we mentioned um, that were, was a direct legacy of both the Mission and the Presidio styles, um, this contiguous form. Um, also that they're an earthen adobe construction with a real substantial wall thickness. Um, you know, uh, if you've ever been into Tumacacari uh, Mission Church, you can really see how adobe really enabled human life uh, here in the extreme temperatures of the Sonoran Desert. Uh, you can, it was the AC of the 17th, 18th, and 19th century was having these substantial walls with, uh, with thermal mass, um, uh, keeping it uh, cool during the day. Uh, and uh, uh, warm also in the, in the winter time. Uh, you also have the, the presence of uh, features uh, known as zaguans, uh, vigas, and stone foundation. Zaguans are, are really interesting. Uh, it's another Arabic word uh, from the Moorish legacy. Um, they're basically these uh, breezeways, oftentimes large enough uh, through which a, a cart, uh, a horse-drawn cart could have been drawn through. Um, and... Uh, that helps with air ventilation and the interior, uh, but also the idea behind the Zaguan was uh, to safely unload um, supplies from those carts in the interior courtyard, uh, close the gate um, uh, uh, for the, the fear of uh, Apache attacks. Um, Vigas are the beams um, that you can see in, above uh, uh, you in the Sonoran Row House style, uh, pine, sometimes mesquite, and also stone foundations uh, with those canales uh, shedding the water off the, the, the roof, uh, the, the, the water splatter, you, you didn't want to have it directly on Adobe, uh, basically, um, so that the, there wouldn't be caving uh, from the water damage. Uh, and here you can kind of see the, the real, the opposite nature of uh, the Sonoran Row House style versus a typical Anglo-American block typology. Uh, as I mentioned, you can see the the Sonoran Row House style uh, building right up to the property line 
with that communal inner courtyard in the middle. That's the focus of the house. Whereas you have the opposite uh, in the American Anglo-American tradition where you have the, the detached property uh, in the middle of the property uh, with a front yard, a backyard, and two little side yards with little to no purpose whatsoever. Uh, and here are some you know, great examples uh, today. If you walk through the Barrio Viejo where you can see uh, deeply recessed doors and windows uh, here in this case, you also notice how high up the foundations are and the steps up uh, to, the, to, to the doorways. Um, this would have been relatively common to build up on the foundation. You see this uh, really frequently in uh, Alamos, the, the colonial silver city in southern Sonora, uh, particularly in mining towns where there was a lot of, one of the byproducts of the mining operations was a lot of the store, stone ore or rubble. And that rubble would have been put to use uh, to build significant foundations, especially thinking of the monsoon season. Uh, where there would have been torrential uh, rains, um, a lot of flooding. Uh, and so in the interest of predicting, protecting your, your adobe earthen architecture building, you would build up uh, a little bit. Uh, I really recommend visiting uh, Alamos to see that, that as well, to kind of link the Barrio Viejo and this architectural tradition uh, in southern Arizona all the way into southern Sonora and beyond. Uh, here's an example of some of the canales. These were, would have been uh, after the railroad would have arrived where uh, access to uh, different materials not native to the Sonoran Desert would have been uh, more readily available uh, for the wicking away of water on these flat roofs. Uh, another uh, real interesting feature of the Sonoran Row House uh, style is the tendency for commercial buildings to be located on the corners. And you have this kind of pan coupe or this cut corner commercial buildings. Um, and the idea is that more people could, could um, kind of collect and, um, and uh, enter the building from the cut corners that you see here. Uh, here is a real great drawing of, of uh, kind of a typical uh, view of, of the Sonoran Row House style in the mid 19th century. Uh, you see the inner courtyards, you see the shade structures, you see the canales, the flat roofs, um, the zaguans, um, the corrals. Um, you know, you, you have this interesting new social sh sp space that is really shaped by this contiguous uh, building rows, uh, the streetscape. You can see that here. And this is a really kind of great recreation of what an interior of a traditional Sonoran row house would have look like being in the frontier uh, furniture would have been very sparse, uh, very um, functional. Um, uh, what you'll also notice too is the, the floors. Floors tended to be um, packed earth. Um, oftentimes they would actually use the blood of an oxen to, to, uh, to seal the earth and pat it down. Um, um, sometimes you'll, you'll see uh, natural builders today use linseed oil with uh, natural earth floor and kind of to the same effect. Uh, you have the corner fireplace uh, as well um, for the winter times uh, here, which is also you can see uh, frequently in, in New Mexico. And this is a really great uh, drawing and a description of, of the Sonoran Row House style from the downtown Tucson uh, partnership. Um, the, you know, mentioning that the oldest uh, homes that we have uh, today for, of this style are from the 1840s when it was uh, still a decade away from becoming America, um, you know, one story uh, as well. Um, uh, you know, plastering would have been uh, would have been common as 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 both financial resources and also uh, manpower uh, uh, would have dictated um, the the ability to 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 plaster. In fact, if you take a tour of Tumacacari, there's still uh, lime plastering. Uh, 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 basically a pit where they would extract the lime from the, the cow. Uh, and so I really recommend checking that out as well. The lime plaster uh, usually made up of, of the cow and also sand uh, would have helped preserve the integrity of the, of the earth and architecture adobe bricks um, about behind the, the, the lime plaster. Um, what's interesting too is that lime has a very uh, hygienic um, quality about it. Uh, and so in Southern Spain, when you visit the, the white Pueblos, uh, actually now with the, the COVID crisis um, 
and, but looking back into the history of the different epidemics, um, there was distribution of, of Lyme plaster. It had a um, very kind of a uh, sanitizing effect uh, during times of epidemics. Um, and so actually the 1840s uh, house that was mentioned in that last slide uh, is really the Charles O. Brown house, which is on Broadway. If you've uh, you know, gone off the, the, the freeway there going into Congress Avenue, uh, you can see this building. And it's really, it's a great building because the juxtaposition um, of it right next to the Unisaurus Energy Tower, the real modern building with one of the oldest uh, buildings in town, uh, basically. Um, this is a, a, a house that's really typical of Tucson homes from the late 18, um, 1800s, you know, where you have Mexican elements blended with, with Victorian ornamentation, uh, as you can kind of see here on, on the porch. Um, Charles O'Brown ran one of the saloons uh, in territorial uh, Arizona in the capital of Tucson. Uh, and so this building still survives today as testament of the Sonoran Row House style. And you can see the layout. Um, some of the oldest parts date back to the 1840s and actual um, other parts date from the 1880s as well. Again, with that orientation with the patio and the gardens. Apparently for some time in the mid 20th century it was a restaurant and there was a huge uh, fig tree in the patio and garden uh, there in the middle. And here's another image uh, as well. Um, talking about the Congress Hall uh, being Tucson's liveliest saloon. And, you know, a lot of things changed for the, for the Sonoran Row House style. And this quote really em emblemizes that change. Uh, this is from Charles D. Poston, who's kind of known as the father, quote unquote, of Arizona. And uh, he wrote this op-ed in the Arizona Daily Star in 1880 with um, kind of with the arrival of the, the railroad. He said, ask a schoolboy what laid the foundation for the grandeur of the Roman Empire. And he will answer the construction of roads. The ancient Pueblo of Tucson has been roused from the lethargy of ages and is embraced in the network of the civilized world. So again, you have that real strong kind of ethnocentrist, um, kind of almost racial undertone of his commentary uh, here uh, about the situation in Tucson. And so then you have kind of phase two of the Sonoran Row House style. It's almost a, a hybrid, uh, basically, where you have with the arrival of more Americans and also the, the railroad connecting uh, Tucson in 1880, you have construction materials and, and also kind of, you know, certain concepts, new concepts of architecture that were brought in. Um, and so, you know, here you, in this drawing, you can see that it is no longer has a flat roof, a roof anymore. Um, and you have also the Victorian embellishments as well, um, the gabled roofs, uh, sometimes with metal. Uh, and here's a great example of that uh, right here in the Barrio Viejo today of that transformed Sonoran Row House style. So where can you find examples of Sonoran Row House architecture uh, today in Arizona? Uh, so this is a great little list from the Arizona Historical Society. Uh, you know, you have the Charles O. Brown House, which we mentioned from the 1840s, Casa Cordova, uh, one of my favorite examples from the 1850s, uh, the Romero House, the Fish Steven House, uh, also, the, the Sosa Carrillo House, uh, which is um, just next to the Tucson Convention Center uh, as well. Also, I want to mention that you can see the style in Tubac, Arizona. Um, the Tucson Presidio State Historic uh, Park has, uh, has a great example of a Sonoran Row House on its property. And then also right across from St. Anne's Church, you have the Pennington House. Uh, which is another uh, fantastic example of Sonoran Row House architecture, especially the, the real high roofs of its of the, the characteristic of that. Uh, and examples of Sonoran Row House architecture are, are a lot more frequent south of the border. Um, and I want to invite you guys, um, if you, uh, you know, once hopefully when it's safe to travel again, to, to join Nonprofit Border Community Alliance on our educational and cultural tours into the state of Sonora. Um, the places like Alamos and Rio Sonora, where there's fantastic uh, examples of this urban expression uh, just all around around the state. Um, particularly in Alamos is a really great example of, uh, of uh, that kind of urban format uh, and also the Rio Sonora as well. So looking towards the future, um, 
this this mural is great because it acknowledges you know during the ter territorial era um there was also a lot of different um uh, different groups of immigrants that came in also that resided in the um, barrio viejo uh, alongside indigenous people and mexican people uh, and anglo-americans you had the chinese as well um you know really famous for their truck farming on the santa cruz river uh, they owned a lot of the groceries uh, you had immigrants from all over Europe, including Eastern Europe. You had many different languages that were spoken in uh, in the Tucson's Barrio Viejo uh, in the late 1800s and early uh, 1900s as well. Um, so looking at the, before we're talking about the future, we'll kind of look at the mid 20th century. And it's it's really important to talk about really the, the, the extreme tragedy of urban renewal in Tucson, where really the historic core of the city was just gutted out. Um, and that happened in 1965. And here you can see um, prior to that, that urban renewal um, in the purple sphere, you can see the, mainly the area that was uh, demolished. And uh, there's a, a wonderful, fantastic book called La Calle, Spatial Conflicts in Urban Renewal in the uh, Southwest City. Uh, it's a book by Lydia Otero uh, from the University of Arizona. Very recommended to, that uh, you read that um, in order to really gain a sense of this. And here you can see um, from a different vantage point looking uh, from south to north, you can see the after effects of, of urban renewal. Um, the Tucson City Council approved this um, downtown redevelopment project really with the help of the federal government and entire blocks of homes and businesses going back to the early 1800s were just uh, demolished. And it's a real tragedy. Um, it's interesting to note that the only uh, Sonoran Row House that was really saved from from this demolishing in this area was the Sosa Carrillo House because of the association it had with uh, Fremont, who was one of Arizona's uh, early territorial governors. Uh, it's not known where, whether he actually stayed there, but the association with him, basically the American, uh, saved that house from demolishing. So what we have now in the Barrio Viejo is basically a third of what was originally there uh, with this unfortunate uh, demolition. Um, one of the last projects I worked uh, with the National Park Service was the, um, an effort to make the Barrio Viejo a national historic landmark. Um, so usually people, if you're not familiar with it, um, national historic landmarks are really um, cultural properties that are confirmed by the Department of the Interior Secretary. They're confirmed as being nationally significant. And um, across the US, there's around 2,500 historic places that, that, um, that have this, this uh, distinction. Um, they're really acknowledged as the, the, the country's most important historical places. Uh, and the National Park Service is, are the ones that really kind of um, help guide along the nomination process uh, uh, for acquiring the NHL um, status. And so, you actually have, we actually have around four different ones that are uh, in Southern Arizona currently. Uh, you have San Javier de Bac Mission, uh, Timumak Hill, the Desert Laboratory, Tombstone, as well as the Titan Missile Site. Um, it's kind of a, a long process, uh, especially because we're not talking about a singular site uh, like um, the San Javier de Bac Mission. We have, we're trying to make an entire neighborhood, uh, many different, uh, different, uh, buildings, uh, all these different blocks uh, uh, can, to be considered an NHL. Um, so it's a really intense process. Um, I helped, I think it was the summer of 2016 where I helped on that um, using both a kind of a, a field group of volunteers that would um, um, document architectural details for each and every house in the Mario Viejo uh, using an app called Fulcrum. And then also another team uh, in the archives of the Arizona Historical Society also doing research and documentation on, on really each and every house uh, in order to really qualify for this designation. So it's still undergoing this process. And so finally, the kind of, um, you know, looking into the, the past uh, for answers for the future, um, one of the, the problems that is really plaguing Tucson and, and really southwestern cities in general are is this kind of urban sprawl. Um, in 2007, in the Phoenix area, uh, it's estimated that the desert was, was losing ground to the urban sprawl at a rate of approximately one acre per hour, um, according to 
um, an a ASU research uh, magazine uh, by Adelaide Fish Fisher. So it's um, this sprawl is no joke. One acre, uh, one acre per hour in the Phoenix metro area, um, and so we're destroying a lot of the the, the basically the Sonoran Desert, the beautiful Sonoran Desert that's surrounding us. Um, and also, the, I, I kind of like the juxt juxtaposition of these two images. Um, you know, uh, if you if you've ever been in a uh, mobile home, it, it, it becomes almost like an oven. So it's very, it's not really the best um, construction equipped for the really extreme temperatures of the Sonoran Desert. On the other hand, you you have this great example of the Sonoran adobe high thermal mass architecture here in the Barrio Viejo, which is perfect for maintaining. Uh, temperatures on the uh, the cool interior in the summer, um, and also the real kind of um, the thriftiness of space with the with the shared uh, the shared basically walls with your neighbor. Um, that that urban sprawl is really really um, is limited. It's much more limited, uh, and so from a real kind of uh, sustainability standpoint, uh, I think going looking back to this really strong tradition in, in our area would be the ticket um, for construction in the future, uh, for the, the future of many Southwestern uh, urban communities. And with that, I wanna thank you for joining us, me for this special video presentation. I also hope you'll join us for the Q&A session uh, this Saturday. Uh, I look forward to hearing from all of your questions uh, uh, about this really fascinating uh, topic. Thank you very much.